Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thank you for watching Inquiry. Several weeks into lockdown, all of us are faced with a difficult decision. On the one hand, we have 2 million people infected by COVID, 150,000 have died. On the other, economies are crashing, millions are losing their jobs, and the UN just put out a report on how 350 million children are directly compromised by the lockdown. So what is the way ahead? To explore these questions, I'm delighted to introduce our guest at Inquiry, Dr. Ian Lipkin. He's widely known as the virus hunter. He's the director of the Center for Infection and Immunity at Columbia University, and he's been on the trench line of every disease in the world. He was the scientific advisor to Steven Soderbergh on the film Contagion, and he's just recovered from a bout of COVID himself. Thank you for joining us, Ian. Always a pleasure to work with you, Shama. Let me start with a fundamental question. Is COVID-19 as uniquely dangerous as we've made it out to be? H1N1 affected 1.3 billion people. Ebola has a mortality rate of 25%, and influenza kills 750,000 people a year. COVID has a mortality rate of 3%, and I've heard you say that it would possibly settle at 0.1%. So is it uniquely dangerous? Are we exaggerating the risk, the problem associated with this? I don't think so. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, the impact of this virus uh, is going to be very large if we don't control it. It is conceivable that the entire world's population could become infected with this virus. If you have a population of 9 billion people, even if 0.1% of people die, that is a staggering number. There's no evidence that this virus is going to disappear like SARS did or Ebola does. It is conceivable that this virus will be with us forever. But because this virus puts such an enormous impact on the healthcare infrastructure, it has wider ramifications because it has completely disrupted us economically and it's disrupted our healthcare system and it's caused political instability. You have people who are dictators now who are claiming that they have to be in complete control because they have this catastrophe to address. So this thing is rippling through it, all aspects of everything. It is having a staggering impact on who we are as a, as a species. So we're really looking at competing catastrophes, Ian, as you've outlined. You know, OPDs are shut, children are suffering, jobs are being lost, but even the exit routes have, you know, the uh, dangers of surveillance and authoritarianism. So it's, it's really a, a weighing scales of disaster, really, which is that many countries are coming to the realization that we can't continue with this lockdown any further. And so let me start with the immediate context of India. How do you think we responded? Was it adequate? No. The United States didn't either. If you don't have sufficient testing and you don't have the capacity to isolate people, then you have, you know, you have a wildfire. So it, it's not that there's anything that could have been done differently given the infrastructure in place at the time that this first presented. But it raises the other, no, no, I'm not gonna finish because I'm, I'm not done yet. Yeah. So, but the question is, why didn't we have the infrastructure? We talked about the importance of global surveillance and ensuring that there is data sharing, transparency, and a public health workforce that is capable of responding. I'm still hoping that somebody who's listening to your show will call me and say, Professor, how can we fix this so it never happens again? This may sound a little clumsy, Ian, but I'll probably be voicing the doubts of many people when I asked you that, could there be errors in math models? You know, there was uh, Dr. Ramnan Lakshmi Narayan who really made headlines in India because he projected that almost 300 to 500 million people in India would be infected by June and we'd be looking at almost 2 million deaths. Now, the disease has had about four months to run through India and though we locked down in March, in a sense, the lockdown has been patchy because people on the ground don't really have the luxury of social distancing. And yet, mercifully, we're not seeing lakhs of people overwhelming uh, hospitals. 
Our death rates are still at 600, 700. So the disease doesn't seem to have exploded. Is there no hopeful sign in that? Could it be that we're developing herd immunity without us even knowing it? You know, we have these cartoon characters who walk off a cliff and they don't fall until they look down. This is what you don't know how many people you have infected because you don't have the testing to give you the evidence. So you're, we're traveling, many of us, we're traveling blind. To get this epidemic under control, this pandemic under control, we have to have a reproductive index for the virus of less than one, meaning that it burns out. Right. To achieve that, we have to not only isolate everybody we find who's infected, but if we identify their contacts, some of those people will be infected and some of them won't. That means they have to be isolated anyway for some period of time, but they have to be isolated in such a way that if one person in that group is infected, that the other people don't get infected. This is how things were controlled in Hubei province. When you're painting such a terrifying scenario, which is, you know, that it has an infectivity rate that could infect the entire world, we have this X factor that we are, it could be through asymptomatic people. And so what we need to do is test and trace, test and trace, test, trace, isolate. But we're really looking at a kind of endless cycle, uh, Ian, because if I'm asymptomatic right now, and so I, I don't show up in the test, and yet I'm possibly infecting others, you know, you'd have to circle back and test me again. This just sounds like uh, the myth of Sisyphus, you know, you roll it up and you roll it down and you roll it up again. Is there no other route out of this? Let's, let's think in terms of what would take us out of this immediately. That's a vaccine. There are many vaccines in development, in clinical testing. There are people who say six months, there are people who say two years. I think the answer is much closer to a year. And the reason for that is that what we're going to do internationally is telescope the usual approval process. Which brings me to the million dollar question. What are countries to do for this one year or more till the vaccines appear? There's no question but that complete lockdown until we have a vaccine is not sustainable. We need to invest in testing and in cores of people who can assist with control. And without this, I don't see how we can open up again. So I realize that that is not something that anybody wants to hear. But we have a lot of people who are unemployed in India, as well as in the United States. And there's, we can think about this as an employment program. Let's find the silver lining. You've put out a big thought, Ian, that we could create employment out of the armies of health workers and testers and trackers that we're going to need. So it could actually become a whole new care economy. I think that that is exactly what we need to do. And we are constructing a curriculum right now that is designed to take people in a very rapid time frame and teach them how to do exactly what we're talking about. There's little that we know The good times come and go But the best is yet to come there's a lot of uh, you know, competing views on China. There's a sense that they were irresponsible, not transparent, uh, and draconian. Others think that they handled it very well. You've been dealing with China from 2003 with the SARS outbreak, and you were there advising them even this time. What is your take on China? Finger pointing is not productive. It's a very large country, larger even than India. We have 1.6 billion people. And to think that everybody's going to move in lockstep doesn't make any sense. There's been a dramatic improvement in the infrastructure in China since 2003. Bear in mind that the first known cases of this outbreak were in the middle of December. The causative agent was identified at the end of December. I heard about it on the 15th. Viral sequence was released in its entirety on the 10th of January. That is actually, if you think about it, it's a very short period of time. And the uh, efforts to control the containment in Hubei province were successful over a period of several weeks. 
when I came back to the United States and I tried to explain to people what the risks were associated with this, there was appreciation for this in the scientific community. But the uh, political community was very slow to respond in an effective way. What, what would you say is the difference in attitude to, uh, in China from when you first started to interact with them to now? Well, China in 2003 was a very different country. First of all, it was just emerging right from, you know, from communism and beginning to embrace some aspects of capitalism. And you didn't have as many people in China who were trained to do what they can now do. In China, many of the people who are high in levels of government did not train as professional politicians. They went overseas, and many of them, in part because their English was not as good as it might be, did not do social sciences, arts, journalism. They did engineering. They did science. So these people are very evidence-based. If you look at Germany, Germany had a very robust, very effective response. They are led by a physicist. Angela Merkel trained in physics. So she too has a scientific orientation. We need, I think, more scientists, more people who are quantitative going into government. Barack Obama, although he trained as a lawyer, was very interested in science. He went to Columbia University, as you may know, and he studied, among other things, astrophysics. So while we're on the subject of China, Ian, there's been a lot of controversy about the relationship between China and WHO. You know, because of the funding patterns, there was a sense that WHO wasn't independent-minded. They played the China game. They were being directed by China according to convenience. Uh, what is your take on that? I don't think people understand the way WHO functions. WHO is an international organization. It doesn't have any enforcement capabilities. It goes where it is invited in. Otherwise, it has to look from the outside and try to surmise what is happening within a country. Until WHO gets an invitation to come in, they don't have the access to the data that they might otherwise need. And, and the idea that at this point, we would be withdrawing support from WHO at the time that we have so many things to do, not only COVID, but you know, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, um, malnutrition, all sorts of things that WHO tackles with a very modest budget. I think WHO is a very good organization. Not perfect, but certainly not something that we should demonize. You're making valid points, Ian, but just recently China has doubled its mortality count in Wuhan by almost 50%. Do you think that was a cover-up and it got exposed through scrutiny and pressure? Or was it a genuine mistake? Oh, I don't think that they were hiding anything. If they were hiding something, they would have made the numbers look much better. Remember that this, we're starting from ground zero. We don't have diagnostic tests for antibodies, for nucleic acid. We don't know the causative agent. The time to sort out what went wrong is when you're no longer in, the, in an emergency situation. While you're bleeding, right? You have to put on a tourniquet and figure out how you're going to save the patient. Was it handled perfectly? No. Are there ways in which it could have been improved? Absolutely. Will it be improved in the future? Of course. Nobody wants to see loss of life. That's not helpful anywhere. You know, uh, Ian, another thing is that there's become a lot of paranoia and stigmatization around China as a society. Uh, you know, countries are wanting to deal with their supply chains. There's a sense that you can't be so dependent on China. And a common sort of popular question is, why do so many diseases arise in China? It's their bad eating habits, all of that. So there's a kind of cultural backlash in China. Do you think there's, you know, as politically incorrect as it is, is there any basis to it at all? I think, I think a large part of that criticism is warranted. Okay. And, you know, the Chinese have an appetite for wildlife, which has gotten them and us through all the rest of the world, into trouble. There's this famous saying in Canton of the Pearl River Delta, which says we eat everything on four legs except the table. <laughs> right? So, you know, they bring in these wild animals, they put them in very close proximity to domestic animals, and then you get exchange of materials that normally we would never see that move into the human population. The vast majority of emerging infectious diseases originate in wildlife somewhere between 60 and 70%, not only in China, 
but in other parts of the world too. Ebola, HIV, Nipah, SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS coronavirus. I mean, there are many of these. Influenza. So these are smallpox and, and monkeypox and things like this. So there are all these infectious agents that have started in animals. And as we begin to, as a result of changes in the way we deal with our environment, expose ourselves, we begin to see more disease. Ian, could you help clarify the relationship between COVID-19, climate change, and other diseases in general? I think people have a lot of confusion around that. If you look at the impact of climate change, which is another man-made problem, right? We have people who are now forced to move because their land is no longer arable. So you have the diseases associated with migration and poverty. You have people who are quite poor, who need sources of protein, who start hunting wild animals. Furthermore, as you have longer periods where it's warm, some of these insects that survive on blood, mosquitoes, ticks, they have a longer growing season. So the opportunity for infection of humans is also extended, not only in terms of time, but also in terms of geography, because you move further and further away from the equator, up into temperate zones, north and south. So we've seen more Lyme disease, we've seen more tick-borne illnesses of all types. So many of these things are self-inflicted wounds. China has more than its share. I just wanted to mention, Ian, that when we were talking offline, you spoke about how many deadly diseases, Ebola, chikungunya, dengue, have not arisen in China, and that even historically, it's been the West that has taken many deadly diseases to indigenous populations uh, like the Spanish to cholera to Mexico and North America. And it's important to emphasize that when we are talking about stigmatizing societies. It's time to start stop thinking about diseases in a nation-centric fashion. These are diseases that are global. They're increasingly so. And we need to address them with you know, with solutions. Ian, that's a great entry point to a question I wanted to ask you, which you're a co-founder of and you're helping to spearhead. What is Gideon and what is the idea behind it? So I've been working now in infectious diseases serendipitously. I didn't intend to go this way. But when I started doing my second training period in neurology in San Francisco, 81 to 84, HIV emerged. And nobody knew where it came from, and nobody knew why people were sick. And there were a whole series of proposals as to what it represented. Many of them were, in retrospect, absurd. And it took two years to figure out why people were sick. We began to see, after HIV, first it was West Nile, there was Nipah, SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS, Lujo, a whole range of infectious diseases it became clear to me that these were gonna be increasing in frequency for several reasons. One, we had people going into areas where the humans previously weren't. Many factors that contributed to that. Secondly, the world was getting smaller because there was increasing tourism and travel and trade. And as a result, something which might start in a very small area, which a hundred years ago would remain circumscribed was now distributing globally quite rapidly. So it became clear that what we really needed to do was to have some sort of a surveillance network that would allow us to recognize when something new appeared. But this all began to coalesce around one guru by the name of Josh Letterberg. Josh Letterberg um, was one of the youngest Nobel laureates in physiology of medicine. He's the one who really discovered the way in which DNA would be exchanged in small elements in bacteria which was fundamental to the whole revolution in biotechnology. And Josh in the late 90s began to push people to think about emerging infections because he be firmly believed that this was the greatest threat to humans on the planet. And I became very involved in this and trying to think about ways in which we could do something. The more we thought about it, the more we realized that the challenge was not man-made threats but things that would emerge in nature, which could threaten humankind. So our concept <clears throat> for the Global Infectious Disease Epidemiology Network is that we have people in hotspots all around the world 
They train together. We start in New York, but it ultimately will decentralize. They will have the capacity to uh, detect chatter, indicating some sort of an infection. Because they're already there, they will be positioned to make the identification rapidly, and they all are committed to data sharing. So anything that they use to characterize an outbreak or try to understand why there's a cluster of disease is immediately posted onto servers that can be accessed by WHO and others. Furthermore, nobody owns those data except the, you know, it's free data. So there's no possibility for profiteering or for biopiracy or any of the other things that have been impediments to data sharing. And we sort of destigmatize this thing and we say, the network found this. Right. Let's respond to this. So what it will give us is an immune system that responds to outbreaks, identifies them early. So the idea is that this is international. It's not going to be US. It's not going to be China. It's not going to be India. It is going to be an international network of people committed to working together to save humanity. That's pretty visionary, really, Ian. We very, very much hope that India will want to be a part of this too, but we don't yet have a partner. So maybe you can help me find a partner. It's also an important shift to be speaking of diseases and metaphors of war, because countries have spent trillions of dollars in building nuclear arsenals, preparing for traditional war. And yet when war came, we've been busted by a bug and we realize we don't even have a bow and arrow to combat it. So what we really need are health armaments rather than nuclear armaments. I think, so. I think you're right on target. The war metaphor that you used is apt and critical. We just have to shift our notion as to what the enemy is. It's not, you know, it's not us. The armament buildup we need is in public health. All of us are spending too little on public health. The problem in working in public health is that if you're successful, nobody knows that you've been successful because all they see is the absence of disease. And the moment there's a failure, then suddenly there's a lot of finger pointing. Right. So that brings me to a good point to ask you about your own experience, Ian. You went to China, you were advising uh, governments over there, you came back to New York, you quarantined yourself, and then you discovered that you had a bout of COVID-19 as well. What was that experience like? And were you afraid? Well, fortunately, I did not require hospitalization, but I, I became ill. I had severe headache. I had fever. I had sweats. I had this persistent cough that lasted for about two weeks. If you think in terms of the amount of time that I lost out of my life, the most productive years of my life. So I'm in China for a couple of weeks. I come back, I'm put into quarantine for two weeks. So now we're up to four weeks. I'm around the city doing what I need to do. And then suddenly I'm back, you know, with uh, fever and illness and so forth for two weeks. Then I have to wait two weeks beyond that. So I've lost two months out of my life. But I have a group of 60 people in New York, of whom only a handful right now are in the laboratory. So this is costing us a great deal economically socially, scientifically, things, breakthroughs that we could be making to help people, you know, for decades to come. So this is, this is a challenge to us all, and it's a challenge to which we must respond globally as well as locally. I just want to circle back to my original question for a moment, Ian. There are scientists in Princeton, Oxford, Stanford, even here in India, who have been arguing that the worldwide lockdown is not the route to go. They've been saying that for countries like India, for instance, whether it's because we have a more youthful population, whether it's the BCG or the weather or that we have a higher immunity system, for some good reason, the disease is not exploding here. So is there a case that we all wear masks and gloves, we observe some protocols, we isolate the elderly, protect them, and we all just get back to work? Is there any way that you would be in agreement with that? this is the most infectious agent uh, that I've ever encountered. So I'm not sure I fully understand what is happening in India, and I doubt very much that anyone does, because we don't understand yet fully what's happening anywhere else in the world. 
I would not be at all surprised if you had a huge problem in India that you don't yet know about. Now, it's also true that poverty kills. What you need to do is to find some way to allow people to get back to work and their lives without spreading this contagion. The way to do that is going to be with literally armies of people who do track tracing, identify somebody who's infected, look at everybody else with whom they've had contact, and tries to find out whether or not they're infected, and then to find ways to isolate appropriately. This is going to require investments in testing and in personnel who can actually do this. We think we're going to need hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. You're going to need much more than that because your population is five times the size of ours, right? But that really is the sort of approach that we need to take. It has to be rigorous, it has to be evidence-based, and it has to be thoughtful. And if we do that, people will be able to go back to work. And I would like to close with one thing that I said. I, I've been traveling to India for many, many years. It has been one of my dreams to set up collaborations and to work more closely with Indian scientists. And if there's any way in which I can be helpful to you, as I have been in other countries, um, and if the Prime Minister watches this, I, I, I am at your service, sir. Thank you so much, Ian. Right. It has been a pleasure to talk with you, as always, and yeah. I wish you the very best. Thank you. My pleasure. I'll alert you when it's up. Okay.